we're just about to launch the Delta IV Heavy with the EFT-1 mission. Uh, you can see it down the road behind me. I'll zoom in in a second. And a quick shout out to the citizens of tomorrow. Uh, Emery Stagmer from uh, Kennedy Space Center. Actually, we're on the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, we're right by the Atlas V pad, uh, kind of halfway between that and the uh, what's called the Beach House. Uh, NASA's got their big cameras and stuff set up here. Um, and this is, a, this is a great vantage point. We're about four miles from the rocket, so there's going to be some time delay for the audio. Um, I'm set up in the kind of the leeward side of a hill. Uh, there's some wind out here this morning, but um, it's missing me over the top of the hill, so the audio should be really cool. Um, beautiful sunrise, and we're go to launch, so here we go. Welcome to Tomorrow, episode 7.36 for Saturday, December 6th, 2014. My, man, it's almost 2015. I know, dude. Holy cats. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me is the beautiful, lovely, and wonderful Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We'll be your hosts for this episode. Now, before we get started, because we have some great news, some amazing things happened in space this last week. Before we get into that, I did want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of Tomorrow, who helped them make this specific segment of this episode go. These are the people who contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. We are a crowdfunded show, which is a, a trending thing. It's something that uh, a lot of uh, organizations are moving towards, and you can get more information on that over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, you saw Vax Headroom, uh, one of our, our premier citizens. Uh, well, I say premier citizens as if it were a patron, but uh, one of our longtime citizens. There you go. Who, uh, who is just a, a great guy. He, he, he goes way back. Uh, <laughs> and he was there at the Orion liftoff. Um, so let's go ahead and actually take a peek at Orion. This is the base launch coverage. Here you go. Six. Five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff at dawn, the dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. I'm going to end up talking over him a little bit, but this launch from Space Launch Complex 37 at 12.05 Universal Time. The flight lasted four hours and 24 minutes, so this is the ascent part of the flight. Now, because Orion was going so high up, the, it, the first stage stayed on there for what felt like forever. <laughs> so the next stop in the, the next scene up that you're going to see is going to be the boost stage. The two boosters on the um, two sides, here they go, they're going to... Main engine cut off. We have cut off in the port and starboard and separation. A good separation of the port and starboard boosters. Keep in mind, the first stage is still attached. So here we go, we've got, uh, uh, this is the, uh, uh, The, uh, service panel, uh, jettison, uh, has occurred. The three 13 by 14 foot panels have separated. And then the launch and abort we have tower. launch abort system jettison. And then we're going to have stage two ignition directly after this. And this is our first view from, uh, cameras on uh, the Orion spacecraft streaming video that are that is coming down being processed through the tracking and data relay satellite system showing a view of the earth as Orion is being carried to its preliminary orbit all of its systems operating in excellent condition on this uh, first test flight of America's newest spacecraft now this test flight was a two orbit test they brought it to a very very high apogee in that second test at around 32,000 kilometers which is uh, I'm sorry, 32,000 kilometers per hour or uh, around 20,000 miles per hour, the apogee being the top part, and then that speed being um, the amount of re-entry that they wanted to get uh, coming back into the Earth. Um, this was to test the heat shield, many different parts of Orion, parts of it being the heat shield, we need to test the parachutes, the avionics, the all of the things, right? Before you put humans on board, you want to test it. Now, because this was a test, article in a test flight as opposed to a normal launch where you go up 
Maybe you drop off a satellite, you're there for a long time. This time, the whole mission, like I said, was four hours and 24 minutes. Right. For, from the time to launch to landing was actually all covered on NASA TV. And they had some of the most remarkable live footage from the middle of the Pacific Ocean That's I think awesome. I have ever seen. Because live footage from the middle of the ocean is not an easy feat. Check this out. This is live, live footage of Orion coming back down. That view of Orion from the Akana. The Akana being a unmanned drone. Awesome. Yep, now if we wait a minute, we're actually going to see... 25,000 feet. Time to splash down less than four minutes. We're going to see, there you go, the drogues deploy. Forward bay cover has been deployed. Drogues have been deployed. And then shortly after this, you're going to see that, that little dot in the middle of your screen. You see these huge parachutes deploy. Great video from the Akana. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. It just takes a moment. 15,000 feet until splashdown. Dude, everyone needs an Akana. Yeah, yeah no, right? Look at this. I mean, it is just, <laughs> it is awesome. just like, I mean, yeah. Coming up on main shoot deploy. Any second now, you're going to see these three gorgeous main shoots open. From a waypoint over the Pacific Ocean, there is your new spacecraft, America. <laughs> oh, it's great over the uh, over the clouds, right? Uh, it is. That was a slightly Jones cheesy away. line by NASA PAO. No. Uh, they're, deploy. They're allowed to be. Something. They're allowed to be slightly cheesy. Looking good. Good right. briefing reported. So they're basically going to kind of feather them out. Yeah. They don't want it to kind of deploy all at once. It would kind of rip all apart. So you're going to see them slowly kind of, and then they're going to kind of, there you go, boom. They just blossom. That's really cool. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it reminds you a little bit of the old school Apollo days. Yeah, this totally. is a camera looking straight up. Oh, that's so cool. And in a second here, you're going to see it. So you're looking up at, and then boom, right. splashdown. Nice. We have splashdown. Splashdown confirmed at 10.29 a.m. Central Time. Orion is back on Earth. America has driven a golden spike as it crosses a bridge into the future. <laughs> golden spike is loving that shout out right there. I, I guess. And then, the, uh, uh, stable one, upright. And then as you heard uh, PAO say, it was actually upright. It was stable. Actually, go back to that shot right there. It's a gorgeous shot. Um, you can actually see that there. You're gonna see a sh yeah. It's very low frame rate, but that it was actually live video of Orion in the ocean as they were prepping to recover it. Absolutely awesome stuff. Now there is a bit of uh, controversy, I want to say, over Orion. Controversy. Controversy. What? And it's actually not even Orion itself. From an engineering standpoint, Orion performed brilliantly. Mm -hmm. It was a great test article. A lot of people are asking though. Why? And the problem with Orion today is that it's a mission to nowhere. Right. We're going to be spending a lot of money to do these next tests, and we, and maybe we're going to Mars with it. Maybe we're going to an asteroid with it. Right. Maybe we're not going to do anything with it. <laughs> we don't actually know what Orion is for, as opposed to the Apollo era, the Apollo capsules, the, the service modules, right. all of that. It was going to the moon. It had a destination. Orion is a program without a destination. Hopefully, we will go... We is... is you know, not, well, it's not even NASA, it's more politics. Hopefully someone will step up and say, look, this is where it's going. It's going to Mars. It's going to the moon. Mm -hmm. At this point, I don't even care. Give it a destination. <laughs> give it a home. Make it something more than just a jobs program. But that's not an engineering problem. From right. the engineering standpoint, all the people who worked on this, mm -hmm. the craft worked brilliantly. The, the c controllers at NASA did a fantastic job. The engineers who put it together, fantastic job. The way it was designed... It, it, it seems to be working really, really great. So yeah. kudos to them because more spacecraft is better. You know, competition in the space industry is a good thing. There so you go. whatever you've got for or against Orion, that aspect of it was absolutely good and, and fantastic. Other great things that are going on, New Horizons, which is about three million, I'm sorry, million, let's try that again, three billion miles away from Earth Waking up today, it's going to wake up at 2000 hours UTC, which is about an hour ago on December 6, 2014. That'd be today. This is just a quick animation of New Horizons. New For those who don't remember, New Horizons launched about nine years ago. It's been on a nine-year journey. It's going to Pluto. This is going to be our best imagery and uh, studying of Pluto basically ever. This spacecraft is going to determine, is Pluto a planet? 
Yeah. Th this is the one that's going to go definitively yes or no. Also, uh, you know, any um, imagery that we've had from Pluto has basically come, not any, but the, the good stuff, the good stuff, I'm air quoting good stuff, came from Hubble. And Hubble, uh, actually, uh, Dada, the next item in there, I think it's called New Horizons 2 or something like that. This is the imagery we get from Hubble. The reason for this is it's just too far away. It can't, it's not, it can't get a great shot of right. Pluto. So uh, New Horizons is going to be up close. It's going to be able to take, I think, like three meter resolution from Pluto. We're going to get amazing footage back from New Horizons. Woke up today. Now, it, it woke up. It's not actually at Pluto yet. It's still quite a ways away. It's going to need to... Um, uh, continue on its journey until about January 15th or so, 2015. Uh, that's when it's going to, the spacecrafts on the uh, uh, vehicle will actually come online and they're going to be able to start taking measurements of Pluto itself. So it's going to kind of do its pass around Pluto and it's going to end up uh, continuing on to the Kuiper Belt. So we're actually going to be able to do some studies out there. That's going to be really cool too. So that, waking up, again, it actually woke up a couple times throughout its journey just to kind of look around. You know, am I working? How's the, how are things going? But this was the last time it's going to wake up. They're not going to put it back to sleep again. So Yay. it's in the final stretch of its mission and that happened today. Also, awesome. Hayabusa 2. Here's some launch coverage. All systems are ready. Main energy ignition. SLB ignition and lift off. I love it. Lift off. I love that every time. So this launched Wednesday, December 3rd at 4.22 Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, this launched from Japan. Hayabusa 2 is heading for asteroid 1999 JU-3. It's going to arrive there June 2018. It's going to do a, a, a speed boost by Earth. It's going to use Earth's gravity to kind of slingshot out there. Uh, it's going to initially park itself about 20 kilometers to 12 miles from the asteroid itself uh, for a survey. Uh, and then it's going to spend about a year and a half at the asteroid. It carries four landers, including a 22-pound robot named Mascot, built by the same team that managed the Philae Comet lander that touched down on 67P not that long ago. Yeah. It's going to be doing a bunch of different tests. And as you remember, Hayabusa 1, which happened uh, a few years ago, uh, is going, it came back, it brought sample returns back from the asteroid, uh, but it only got like itty bitty, it, it didn't quite, it was it was crippled with issues. It still made it, it was, it was a little right. lighter that could, yeah. but it just had so many issues, they only got like microscopic samples back. They're hoping that they can get more back with Hayabusa 2, uh, Hayabusa 2, excuse me. And um, yeah, it's going to land in the Australian outback in December of 2020. So that, uh, that launched this last week as well. We also had a couple of Soyuz launches. We're only going to show you one of them. This was the upgraded GLONASS K satellite uh, system. I'm showing you this one because this launch footage is epic. We had to tone down the audio and even then it overmodulates. Check this out. The beauty and power of a Soyuz launch is just astounding. The, the crippling sound you heard was the uh, force of the audio pressing against the mic element and preventing it from actually coming back fast enough. Okay, but but to be fair, uh, what I because I always thought that that was a microphone issue. Whenever I saw a launch mm -hmm. or videos of launch, any launch, mm -hmm. I always thought like, oh, crappy microphones. Why do they no, always no. put crappy microphones out there? No, no. no, when you stand there, your own crappy microphones, uh, same exact thing. Your eardrums like reverberate like crazy pants, yeah. and that's exactly how it sounds in real life. Assuming you were that Close. Don't be that don't close do, to it. That, that was a Soyuz 21B. <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's a 2600 pound uh, navigation satellite. It's the second of the K series, is it? Yeah, mm -hmm. the K series that has been launched 
and uh, they're looking to upgrade, update their entire constellation. Uh, we also have a uh, launch from China. This was the Long March 2D launch. This launched 7:12 according to Universal Time. Uh, there's no real audio with this because it is a Chinese launch. So uh, it's a. Uh, they don't it's want to a, give you anything. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Here, here. Let's just. You know, we don't even need to air these. We can just do the wow. exact. Well, nobody's saying anything, so therefore no audio. No, well, no, there's no audio. So the. No, but I mean, really, everyone's silent. <laughs> the, it's the same stuff. It's a remote sensing bird that will be used for scientific experiments. Experiments, land survey, crop yield assessment, and disaster monitoring. I can just cut out this segment of tomorrow anytime they do one of their military launches and play it this over is what again. Doing. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, no, it's a military satellite. Um, uh, we think it's just it's going to be an imaging satellite, and off you go. All right, uh, there's some SpaceX news because we've got CRS5 on the horizon. So for that, we're bringing in Space Mike. Space Mike, what's going on uh, in SpaceX land? Hello, everyone. So um, there have been quite a few interesting changes. SpaceX is up to launch their CRS-5, the fifth actual mission for the CRS program. And with this mission, there have been a couple of changes due to the Antares accident that happened on October 28th. The manifest um, has been changed and hasn't been publicly released yet, probably to assess the last minute changes as to what is needed and what is ne necessary to be sending to the ISS. Thankfully, uh, the ISS program managers plan for this sort of contingency, and they are just fine for at least the next six months, and we can't forget about all the other cargo spacecraft as well. So Antares and the Cygnus blowing up didn't set things back too much other than the unique hardware on that. Uh, so far, though, for this mission to replace whatever necessities were needed um, from the Cygnus mission, on CRS-5, the only confirmed payload for, so far is CATS. And no, that's not some sort of awesome space CATS, but oh. <laughs> I was disappointed, too. I was disappointed, too. But what it does stand for is the Cloud Aerosol Transport System, and it's going to be attached to the key module, and it's going to be sensing dust, pollution, smoke, and other sort of particulates in the air. And uh, from the ISS's unique view viewpoint, that information will be helpful for lots of different greenhouse gas studies that are being conducted. Um, other than that, though, the other payloads haven't been released yet, as I said. But so far, NASA has given SpaceX December 16th as a placeholder for the launch, uh, with uh, December 19th and 20th as a backup if there are any delays. Anything further than that, if it does get pushed back, then uh, that's going to have to be reassessed and, and planned at that time. But very cool, because uh, this mission is doing some really cool new things. First of all, they have been uh, SpaceX has been working with new um, GERD fins that will help to stabilize the first stage as it makes its power descent back into the atmosphere. And uh, there's a really sweet picture of them right there. And they may not look like much, but the, that particular pattern helps to stabilize, especially with, with any sort of uh, unforeseen uh, wind gusts or anything like that that has claimed one of the first stages returning before. And so these stabilizer fins are going to help a lot to be able to have a pinpoint landing for the first stage. And this is important because the barge uh, floating landing platform that SpaceX has been working on is pretty much ready to go, and they are going to attempt to land the first stage on this barge barge in the Pacific Ocean. And Elon Musk has said that he pretty much expects a 50% success rate because there are so many factors involved with a, a pinpoint landing like this, especially for a target that might be moving. There's all sorts of errors that can occur with GPS and, and different things like that. However, because just the fact that they are ready to push forward with this test, regardless of whether or not they recover the first stage, is a feat in and of itself. And if they are successful, then they can continue to move forward with their land with their program of being able to recover the first stage and reuse them and bring the cost down like they've been planning all along. That is so cool. Uh, that's so exciting. It's it's kind of ridiculous. And to think that, you know, they could be on something that tiny or land on something <laughs> that tiny is is I I 
you know, insert inappropriate joke here, I suppose. But um, <laughs> that's very cool, Mike, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, uh, to update us on all of those things. And um, to, speaking of the International Space Station, which is where my understanding of the CRS-5 mission is going to, on um, one of the last missions, there, uh, I can't speak, what, what was brought up was a 3D printer to the International Space Station. And this is just such a cool, cool thing. And uh, a good friend of ours, Jason Dunn, has been working on this for a really long time. So it just it just gives me goosebumps to talk about at all. Uh, but so 3D printers, as you are aware, uh, you know, make things in three dimensions. And when you don't have gravity, that makes things very, very difficult. So to have a 3D printer on space uh, on space on the International Space Station is just a really awesome thing. Uh, it actually launched September 21st via a Falcon 9 rocket. Um, it's the first 3D uh, part, or it's the first 3D printer, obviously, in space, and the first 3D printed part was printed on, those are the words I wanted, November 24th at 2128 UTC. Uh, this is the first time that the hardware has been, uh, that has had an additively manufactured thing in space, as opposed to just launching it from Earth. Uh, the first part made in space is a functional part of the printer itself. It's a faceplate. As you can see, it says made in space. And NASA, although and I don't know the why they used lo- they used the worm they logo. Were used, exactly, I don't know why they used the worm logo. Maybe I maybe they couldn't didn't have the resolution. They for quite the... literally ran out of space for it. <laughs> 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 but intended. But yeah, yeah, I, I thought that was really cool having the first three D printed part in space. Uh, which if we're going to Mars or mm-hmm. if we're doing anything in space, we can't bring spare parts for absolutely everything with us. Right. But we could bring a three D printer. So mm-hmm. as things start going wrong, you could three D print your replacement parts right there in space as necessary. Saves Very tons cool. of space and weight um, and could potentially save lives as well for future missions beyond Earth orbit. Uh, so uh, I thought that was absolutely awesome. All right, we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, a live interview with David Iron of Lunar, what is it? Lunar Missions Mission Limited. One. Well, yeah, Lunar Missions Limited, but Lunar Mission One. It's yes. a crowdfunded campaign to send a lander to the moon. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Look into her face to turn my nation in her eyes She won't give up a quick or for a little fashion lies Filled with awesome expectation This girl's a fascination And welcome to tomorrow. First and foremost, I definitely want to make sure that we uh, thank our patrons from Patreon. This, these are our per- Patreon Premier members, which are the five dollar and above segment. Um, love seeing all of these names; it's so awesome. I also a particularly nice shout out to Mom Dog and Dad Dog. Uh, some personal uh, family members of ours, if you don't mind there for a second. And uh, of course, if you uh, want to give money to tomorrow, you can always hit up Patreon slash TMRO. So here we are with an interview from the much anticipated Lunar Mission 1, which is a very, very cool thing. And we have with us, of course, David Iron, who's a founder of Lunar Missions Limited. David, welcome and thank you for uh, joining us here in tomorrow. And hi, it's uh, great to talk to you. It's awesome to talk to you. This is so exciting. I'm I'm totally thrilled to be doing this right now. So uh, for people who may not have heard quite yet, can you tell us what Lunar Mission 1 is? Sure. It's a science mission to the moon. We're going to send an unmanned robotic uh, spacecraft to land at the South Pole. And we're going to drill. We're going to drill very deep much deeper than before, we're talking about tens of metres down, possibly to as much as 100 metres. And we're going to do science, science of the lunar uh, geology below the surface layer. Um, we're going to do science of the South Pole area um, to see if it's uh, feasible to have a, a, a manned, permanent manned uh, base there for science. We're going to do a bit of science from the moon, um, like uh, uh, investigating the, the prospect of a low-frequency radio astronomy experiment. But the really funny, exciting bit is the idea that we use the borehole as a place to deposit uh, a time capsule, a time capsule which could last a geological time scale. Um, we're talking about a billion years or so. 
Um, the location there is wonderful for uh, preservation. It's very cold, it's protected, um, it's got no uh, atmosphere or anything like that. All the things that degrade life and material on Earth are, are gone. So our time capsule will uh, record life on Earth. It's a digital record um, of human history civilization and include a description of uh, the biological life, uh, climate and uh, a species we've got here, kind of database. Um, and then we invite people to pay a bit of, uh, of money for um, including their own personal information. It's a kind of private archive that sits along the public archive. And um, uh, people, we, we, we've tested the, uh, this concept of people paying to include themselves. Um, and it works very well. Um, and the thing that really uh, gets people to pay in, in hundreds of dollars rather than just the tens of dollars is being able to store a single strand of hair, which itself is, is a form of information because in that, inf inf in that piece of hair is, is their DNA. Um, and the tests show that uh, we will get a good pickup. It's still a niche product, but a small portion of a large number is, is still a large number. And that funds the mission. We need about uh, up to about a, a, a billion dollars altogether, including the uh, the educational outreach, um, uh, but our, our, our experts tell us we should be able to exceed that. Um, and the whole thing is uh, led by uh, a non-profit, um, and that non-profit will take any excess um, and use it to fund future space science and exploration. That's very cool. So that's what the Lunar Missions Limited is all about, is that correct? That's right. Um, we're, we're actually going to be led by a, a top level by a trust. It's, it's a non-profit um, and we've got a, a Lunar Missions uh, Limited uh, operating company um, and that enters into contracts. We've got two main stages. We've got to set up the main contracts um, and uh, Lunar Missions Limited is putting together a management team to do that. So we're setting up the setup, if you like, um, and to fund that first few months, um, we've gone to Kickstarter to um, raise the money to do that because we've got to do this professionally. We're, we're, we're going beyond the point where we can do this um, on the back of our own evenings and weekends. Um, and we've got a, um, a very professional set of organisations. Uh, several universities, principally UK at the moment, but when we announced it two or three weeks ago at the Royal Society in London, um, that announcement was also an internationalisation uh, of the project, and a lot of it's going to be done, we're pretty sure, um, in the US. That's uh, that's so cool. I, I just absolutely, I love this idea all the way around. Um, so. I guess I see I have some notes. So I wrote down why start this project and, and you kind of partially answered that uh, all the way, you know, with your last answer to your last question. Um, but I guess my understanding is by reading all of the information you have on the Kickstarter pages, like you said, that you've been working on this for at least is it three years, seven years? Seven. Seven years. OK, <laughs> so you've been working on this for seven years and now you've got this Kickstarter project. But why start it in the first place? What, what was the initial idea? Um, it's, it's mainly driven by the difficulty of funding these uh, expensive uh, scientific exploration missions. Um, it was around about the time that the US had the Constellation program and that was increasingly difficult to, to maintain. Eventually it was cancelled. NASA still has a problem um, uh, getting uh, the funding to do what it needs to do. It, you know, it, it, people expect it to do more than they give money for. And the UK Space Agency and, and European Space Agency, most space agencies have a problem with, with money. And a lot of people, mainly be a quarter of the population, don't like the idea of space exploration anyway. They think it's not worth doing. They, they'd rather spend the money, taxpayers' money, on education and, and health and security, that kind of thing. Um, whereas um, there is a group of people in, 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 in the top taxpayers and who, who just love the idea of space exploration. I can see the advantages, the long, long-term economic advantages of it. So what um, uh, I, I did was to find a way of turning upside down the funding model instead of getting a small number of entities, space agencies spending a lot of money, getting a large number of entities, that's people, us, uh, spending small amounts um, uh, doing things that uh, they would want to do. There's a kind of, if you like, a consumer proposition behind this, but in doing so, they fund space science. So what we're doing is getting the people who want it to happen to pay for it and take part in it. And, and there's loads and loads of other things that people can do, like you know, education, schools. It all starts to come together. Once the funding's there, then um, the whole thing seems to work. That it, it, it all, it, it, it all, it all clicks. Can I ask kind of? 
of an odd question. It, it feels a slightly um, chicken and egg kind of situation because I'm really excited about the science part. But I'm also really excited about being able to put some of my fabulous hair on the moon. So uh, <laughs> how did you come to join these two ideas together to make one project? <laughs> well, um, I, I was actually asked informally by um, members of the British establishment to, to help out. I'd already um, I, I've been working in the space sector, um, getting projects financed, um, odd, unusual, first-time projects for about 16 years. I, I did the first public-private partnership, created the financing and commercial structure, uh, the first PPP in, in, in space. Um, and. Um, uh, they, 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 they asked me to help out with space science and exploration. So I spent a few months looking around. Um, I represented the UK with a, a bilateral uh, discussion with, with NASA. I helped NASA out with his own plans for um, uh, bringing in private sector capital, uh, commercializing space exploration. Um, I was asked to look at a, a, a lunar drilling uh, project uh, internationally. I, I chaired a, uh, a, a, an international workshop. Discovered that uh, the U.S. had been quite a lot, been doing a lot of uh, uh, work uh, over several years, but the funding had stopped. Um, and uh, uh, during the course of this, I discovered. I, I just thought through that the borehole that we're creating um, could be used for a time capsule, and I could see how people would. I um, want to put information down there, it had to be information, you can't put seeds or anything like that, it's got to be very low mass, very low volume. Um, but I couldn't see how um, people, I'd get enough people paying enough money uh, to fund the hundreds of millions, the billion or so that it would take to, to, to fund the whole thing. So um, I just parked the idea in my mind and then six months later I was wandering around the garden um, uh, uh, doing uh, um, uh, with my mind in neutral, as 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 us male gardeners sometimes do. We, always, you know, we, we get told what to do, and our, our minds are thinking something else. And this idea of DNA as, as hair just popped out of the head. And as soon as I I I, I, I thought of it, uh, it took a couple of minutes to, to think, think. My God, this is this is crazy. Uh, am I really? Uh, thinking of this, and I thought, well, yes, yes, it is. Uh, it, it, it can work because DNA uh, as hair um, gets the, uh, the the personal information, action, um, emotional interest, um, and it's tiny. Um, it, it, it confirms the requirements of low mass, low volume, uh, and I reckon I can get people paying hundreds of dollars, and, and that is what the market research has has proven. And as soon as that, I, I got over that two minute shock. Um, I realized I had it. I, I could I, I could close the business case. I love it. I love it. So um, we, of course, have a live audience and they have many, many questions. So I'll try to throw a couple of these at you if that's OK. Sure. sure. Perfect. Uh, so uh, Riken asks, uh, are there other samples that are will be available to be on board other than human hair? Um, it, it's it's um, as a consumer proposition, it's marketed to 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 to, um, to people but that doesn't stop people putting in pets. I, I, I reckon one to two percent of the of the uh, of the hair is, 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 is not going to be human, is, is, but it's going to be humans paying for it. Okay. Um, the public archive, on the other hand, is um, there for more uh, for education and for professional research. Um, we're looking to put together a professionally uh, assembled uh, biodatabase for biodiverse, biodiversity uh, experts, evolutionary biologists, environmental scientists, and so on. Um, and we'll get some schools uh, to take part in that worldwide. Um, but they probably won't uh, put down hair as DNA. They'll, they'll, they'll simply put the, the, the DNA records of individual species in as, as uh, digital data. Awesome. Um, Adrian is asking uh, uh, some more details on the Kickstarter project itself, it sounds like. Um, how much will it send to send the hair, and how much to send a video or picture of myself? Um, the, the pricing will take about, uh, will not really be announced about four or five years because we've got quite a lot of work to do on the science. We don't even know what the capacity of the data archive is just yet. We need, it depends on the technology we decide. That's one of the things we need to do over the next three years. But um, uh, to give you a guide, um, I've been planning the business case um, on the basis that a single anonymous deposit of hair will cost eighty dollars but most people will spend we think around about two three four hundred dollars something like that to include not just the, the um, DNA the hair but also information so you can include uh, some some information may actually be tagged 
to to the DNA, so it's permanently fixed uh, uh, to your hair, and the rest of it will go uh, into the main digital archive as, as the private paid for bit. Um, the um, as to the information cost alone. Some people don't like the idea of their DNA, their, their hair being on the moon, so, but they do like the idea of uh, personal information. And for that, um, the price will, will probably start a few dollars, three, four dollars, something like that, to say, hi, I'm Joe from Wisconsin, you know, five dollars, two dollars, something like that. Um, but but uh, um, for uh, more information, uh, family histories, you know, hundred dollars, thousand dollars, the thing that people will discover is that photographs um, will cost, videos will cost more um, because people will be charged by capacity. They can put whatever digital information they like. Um, we don't care. It's it's their information. It's your information um, and you own it. Uh, um, you decide whether to keep it secret or you know, to your friends and family by a code word or, 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 or um, make it publicly available. Um, and the more information you put in, there are economies of scale, so the price per bit goes down, but it's still the price still goes uh, up um, uh, uh, the more you put in. Um, and uh, people will discover that it's much cheaper to put in text information, you know, word documents and so on, word process documents, um, and it's probably better to put in small photographs. So you can get about a thousand small um, selfies uh, in for the same <laughs> capacity. Uh, as as a one single high resolution photograph. Right. Um, now you can put in a high resolution photograph if you like and if you're wealthy. But I, I would suspect that most people, I certainly would not spend my money on that. I'd spend it on uh, a collection of family photographs which are uh, lower resolution, but you know, good enough to see and, and to make out. Right. And of course, all this information. All this information will be available anyway as as as, as a um, uh, as a terrestrial uh, store, you know, something like YouTube and various other things. We we'll we'll, we'll we'll probably do a deal with with an online uh, 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 application of some kind, um, and 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 that they 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 would they, they would hold the information uh, on behalf of the customers like that. Awesome. So. I, like I said, I checked out your Kickstarter page. There is so much information on there. Your website has even more. It's awesome. But why don't you give a shout out to uh, your Kickstarter page and or your website where people can get even more information. Surely. Um, it, it, it's on Lunar Mission 1, uh, www.lunarmission1.com. Uh, That's the uh, main project site. And then there's a Kickstarter site here. Um, you can get involved from $3 upwards. Sorry, it's for three pounds, five dollars. One of the problems we've had is that uh, we know there's a lot of interest in the US, but because we're launching from London, everything's in in, in pounds sterling. But don't worry, um, anybody, uh, any currency can be used. Kickstarter is very good for that. Um, so you can pay in dollars, you know, credit card, anything like that. Um, the, 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 the key thing to go for is around about eighty dollars, um, because that gets you a, a voucher worth that amount of money, which you can then trade in uh, for the uh, um, the, the product when it's eventually d uh, um, uh, decided, but that eighty dollars is intended for the single strand of hair, and that's a kind of entry level to reserve your place in space. Uh, and and if you want to get involved as a school, you can do that. You can you can, you can buy something that's that's more expensive, and then spread it amongst uh, uh, amongst a class or, or, or indeed a school. And and there are offers for for couples and 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 uh, families as well. Awesome. This is so exciting. And there's only 10 or 11 days left. So you guys better get your money in now. And then of course, we'll have to have you back on David in, a, in the future so we can see how your progress is going and anything else that you guys have got going on, uh, you know, here in the future. Karen, I'd be delighted to talk to you again. Yes, that would be awesome. Thank yeah. you for joining us. And when we come back, we will take questions from our previous show. One, zero. Lift off. The fleet of space shuttles are doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, or our last show, excuse me, I did want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment of this episode go. These are the Patreon Plus subscribers. We do have a new Patreon Plus subscriber who is uh, Jash. 
I'm hopefully pronouncing that right at the very bottom of the screen there. So welcome to the community, Josh. Uh, we've also, and these are the people who have contributed $3 or more to this episode, but we've also got people who've contributed $1 or more to this episode, or actually these are just $1, excuse me. And uh, Lassie and Robert, uh, Robert, Lassie Larson and Robert Hooper at the uh, very end of the uh, screen there are the new patrons at this level. Again, welcome uh, to the community, guys. Um, and uh, if you want more information on that, you can reach reach us over at patreon.com slash TMRO. We have both been struggling. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, there's, something something about, there's something about the, the live community uh, aspect of the show where we're both like, ah. It's the purple background. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, sw we switched out the gel, so now it's purple again. Oh, and uh, for those of you watching After Dark... We have, I have been um, actually hunting around and trying to find for realsy studio space. And so uh, if I think of it, we'll drop those pictures into our system so we can show you um, what uh, what the different spaces look like and kind of what we're planning those, for 2015. boring, boring pictures. Here's an empty space. Yeah. Here's a different empty that's space. Much, so, uh, Here's that's, a differenter empty space. That's what you can look forward to. And all those Patreon Yay. Plus subscribers, you're going to get access to that right away. <laughs> Everyone else, you have that in about four weeks or so. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Now, uh, last show, I told you, look, if you want to be part of the comments, use Twitter. Use the hashtag TMRO. Um, you can also now, because we the Twitter account finally got approved, we now own the Twitter account at TMRO. You can use either one of those that is going to be the primary way to contact us uh, there is a technical reason for that moving forward so we wanted to reward everyone all the comments this week come from twitter first up yay uh well and the best part about twitter are all of these usernames that i very much so cannot so pronounce dsl synth a dsl synth said so what do you think about reaction engines and their hashtag saber engines and hashtag skylon spaceplane designs uh, uh, hashtag outright awesome. So I feel like now that hashtag. we have hashtags, we have to, oh yeah, hashtag. yeah. So I'll do the Jimmy Fallon, I'll do the Jimmy Fallon hashtag. With hashtag the Saber Engines, straight, hashtag so. Skyline Space Plane Design, no, no, hashtag. hashtag outright awesome, yeah, hashtag. hashtag TMRO. I right, say so you go. Uh, uh, I think <laughs> it, it's interesting, but it's still a ways away, right? So right. it has the potential to change a lot of things. I, single stage to orbit planes both make a lot of sense and make no sense at the same time because all of that mass is senseless. Yeah. You're bringing a lot of weight up there that you're not using. But it's also, it acts more, it could potentially act more like an airplane where you're right. not throwing things into the ocean, which that makes a ton of sense. So uh, there's a there's trade-offs there and yeah. I'm not sure how those actually end up faring. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see it actually working in the real world and, and actually flying. And we're still probably a decade or more away from that because mm. they're still kind of in the development space. But I, I think it's really cool that they're working on it and I, I look forward to seeing some of those uh, continued developments. So, how's that? Very there you go. Cool. All right. I, I should also mention that that uh, comment came from in on November 17th. And, oh, uh, that, I just posted the dates because the, I, it was part of the copy paste. It is part of It's still kind of interesting. All though. right, all right. Yeah, whatever you uh, do. So, Anarchic Soul from November 18th says, Hashtag tomorrow. I think it's more important for movies to be inspiring <laughs> rather than realistic when it comes to space exploration. Yeah, so this goes to the topic of um, should movies be more scientifically factual right. than fantasy as they kind of have been? Or is it okay to bend the rules to fit into your storyline? If I may really quickly, uh, I don't... I've, I. After having this discussion a number of times with a number of different people, I feel as though I've come to the conclusion, me personally, and I can only speak for me, sure. that the bending of the rules I feel are kind of okay where, uh, you know, when you're dipping into a black hole, we don't know what's on the other side, right? And so the whole dipping into a black hole part, I'm kind of cool with, well, we don't know what's going to happen, so anything can happen. And so taking artistic license and doing what all ever you want to do with that, handshakes with the cosmos, I'm okay with that. But the launching a rocket from seven stories underground that's right off of a conference room while welding and locks run off is going on, what? I'm not okay with that. What movie, that's could the, you, what movie could you ever be speaking that's about? That's the part I have an issue with, okay? <laughs> um, you know, the core is, you know, there's parts of the core of the earth that we don't really understand and we don't know necessarily. I'm, I'm sort of okay with getting through a weird, like, diamond area but as soon as you're like but we're gonna set off nuclear reactors they're gonna be in a chain reaction it's just gonna restart everything that's the issue i suddenly we have. need to drill so like, to the center of the earth and restart the core best bad sci-fi so i've, I've realized that when it comes down to there's an actual answer for this people out there 
<laughs> then just use the real answer. But when it's like, well, we're not really sure. It could be this. It could be that. Then I'm, I'm totally okay with artistic license. Yeah, but Jim, that's pers- that's Jim, just me. Jim Nobles in the chat room says, what about the science in, say, Star Wars? Which, by the way, is less of a sci-fi thriller and more of a uh, fantasy. Right. That's that's more space opera to me. And at that point, <laughs> it's it's all fiction. And so I don't. it does not bother me in any way, shape, or form that there's a lightsaber with like other stuff coming out the side. Like... <laughs> Doesn't doesn't phase me in the slightest. Uh, as an aside, for those of you who did enjoy the Star Wars episode five, seven uh, trailer, <laughs> as I had it, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, episode seven trailer, um, look up episode seven George Lucas um, special edition version. Mm. It's hilarious. That's all right. Funny. Moving right along. Uh, U5KO on November 18th says, Do you think Ad Issa will catch up to the Na- to NASA in terms of budget in the next, say, 20 years? Hashtag tomorrow. Also, thoughts on the Orion service module? So the Orion service module brought up because it's part of the uh, ATV, HTV, ATV uh, vehicle, or it was derived oh, right, from that. right, right, right. Right, so, uh, and that'd be from Issa. And um, do I think that ESA, the European Space Agency, will get up to the funding of NASA? You know, uh, we were talking before the show, uh, interesting little factoid. We complain about, you know, NASA being underfunded and not getting the, right. the amount of funding that it needs and, and deserves. And, and that's not untrue. But here's a fun little thing. NASA gets more money than all of the world's non-military space programs combined. Yeah. So if you take... The rest of the entire world, non-military space programs, and add them up, you still don't reach the budget of NASA. So ESA has a long way to go to catch up. And they're, you know, with their successes with the fillet lander, uh, you know, they're going to hopefully have some successes kind of in the future as well with... Um, um, there's an, another mission off Titan Atomic. It's not coming to me. Uh, hopefully, people will get more and more excited uh, uh, with the programs that ESA is doing, and they will start throwing more money their way. Uh, but in the next 20 years, obviously, that's a long way out. My crystal ball doesn't look forward that far. I just do not see them reaching NASA's current funding goals. What could happen, though, is the opposite thing, where NASA actually goes down right. by large amounts. And ESA kind of goes up or up a little bit, and eventually they intersect each other. Uh, I would, I hope that does not happen. I mean, I hope that NASA doesn't go down at least that quickly and that far. Right. But that is a possibility. Right. So I, I think that the political might will prevent that from happening. I hope it does. But yeah, that's something that could go on too. All right, next up. Uh, from Destructor111 on November 19th, hashtag tomorrow. <laughs> Not sure how I feel about commenting on Twitter. I usually like to write short novels to you guys, and Twitter doesn't... Er- <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> but it does enable us to start doing some cool social things, which is... Uh, um, which made why- me giggle. I did actually throw it into uh, into Twitter. To, sorry, I don't know why I just randomly hashtag there. To see uh, if it was 140. To see if it was 140 was characters. It? And when you at Space Vidcast, it is. But if you uh, at TMRO, it's not. you have a lot more space. Oh, see, there you go. There you go. We're helping you. We're giving using... you more space. There, I made a pun. I hope you're all happy. It was very punny. Next up. <laughs> Um, a man few words from November 19th said a sci- scientifically literate society is key to solving many of the problems we face on Earth. The entertainment industry could help out. Absolutely. Hashtag tomorrow. Absolutely. Completely agree. There doesn't need to be a, a separation between the two. No. And, um, you know, the, the entertainment... You know, Apollo 13, I think, is actually a really good movie. Yeah. And um, it was scientifically pretty freaking accurate. Mm-hmm. And with ever so slight artistic license. Ever so and slight I'm, artistic I'm okay license. And I, I think they the two kind of help each other. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we can get more movies like that. Yeah. There you go. Agreed. Next. Uh, at Colossal Thrust, November 20th said, hashtag tomorrow. Do I smell social integration milestone coming to fruition? You, in fact, do. Unfortunately, it's taking way longer than I had anticipated. <laughs> and you still have to wait even longer. But uh, yes, absolutely. But thanks for the question. Uh, thanks for the question. And we get to use the cool pictures in the tweets, which I like now. Those yeah. are your, uh, your, your Twitter pictures. Your, now, uh, we did, I did say every everything was going to be Twitter. And that's how it's going to be moving forward. But... There was an incredible post on Reddit, and we were talking about uh, women's role in in rocket science and STEM in mm-hmm. general. Mm-hmm. And it's a very, very long post. It would very much so not even remotely begin to fit in 140 characters. And we have just the very, very end of the post 
Uh, and this is from, oh no, we didn't put the name in there. So uh, just move forward one, uh, Dada, mm -hmm. and this is, this is it. So this is just the end. Go ahead and read that for us. It says, um, as troubling as these results are, they are also critical. They are also critical towards solutions. That biases against women are often subconscious means people need extra prodding to realize and combat them. I'm willing to bet that many in the study, just like people who take implicit association tests, would be upset to learn they subconsciously discriminate against women and that they would want to fix it. Implicit biases cannot be overcome until they are realized, and this study accomplishes the key first step, awareness. I completely and totally agree. So if this, and, and you know, I don't actually see it happening, but I'm also not a woman in STEM. This, so. I, I went to uh, part of the time, there are a couple of links that, that created this comment, if you will, uh, and I, I went through just very quickly, and this comes the, the sort of subconscious discriminations is, is what this commenter is speaking about came directly out of a double blind test where identical people, identical, I'm sorry, resumes were given to male and female mm. uh, people in the scientific community. And they were asked many questions. The only differences were the male or female names on the identical resumes and consistently males were the male male person mm -hmm. was seen as being more competent better educated uh, a better just fit all the way around and they were also offered more mentoring for their position right. and better roles etc cetera, etc cetera. everything else being exactly identical double blind right. and males and female uh, people already in the industry we're already discriminating against the woman because of the name. And, and I, it was I think impressive. it's easy to point at people and say, you know, men are pigs. But um, I don't. I think that that ending part of that comment really nailed it. Yeah. Which is, if you don't realize you're doing it, exactly. being aware of it would help a great deal. Absolutely. Uh, so there was a tiny URL in that form. Uh, it's some randomized thing. Right. We'll uh, put yeah, links in our show notes yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I highly suggest reading this the the Reddit post on that. I thought it was very insightful, very eye opening. Um, and obviously continue your comments there or add them into Twitter, however you want to do that. Uh, but I wanted to bring that up in the show because I did think that was important. And I do think that um, there shouldn't be gender bias in something as um, unbiased as, as science, science, right? I mean, science is very, it, it is what it is, right? Yeah. So uh, there you go. That's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, we do have Mars, on, Mars One coming on our next show. So we've been talking about them, going back and forth, saying, you know, I'm not convinced that they can do this well. Uh, the CEO and founder of Mars One is going to be on our next show talking about those very issues. So if you have questions, certainly feel free to tweet them. Just hashtag or at TMRO and we'll bring them up in the show. Thank you so much for watching After Dark. Up next.